Now, of course, uh, many of you have either been in, in Barma Miller or have some direct involvement in participation today. Uh, of course, the, uh, the location of, of this is uh, in the southern Murray-Darling Basin, 66,000 hectare wetland or, or reserve, where about 85% of it is actually an active floodplain and therefore wetland system. The site really is rich in flora and fauna, uh, as you can imagine when you've got a uh, diversity of landscapes and such a big system. And a lot of the talks uh, over the next two days will concentrate on things like birds, fish, uh, reptiles, and a lot on plants. Also about some of the history and spatial mapping. I mean, we've, we've got a, a fairly diverse range. We've got some notable um, research emissions. Like at the moment, we, we don't know a lot about the insects in the forest. There's been frog monitoring for five or six years. It's been discontinued. And uh, we don't really know a lot about the mammal fauna, uh, the aquatic species. Uh, Neville's uh, obviously spoken about the, the significance of the site to Aboriginal um, uh, occupation. Certainly the, the change in the structure of the forest uh, through, through European settlement, certainly with grazing initially by sheep and then by cattle in the early part of the 1800s and then timber cutting um, it substantially reshaped the structure of the forest to what we see today. Uh, which commenced really in the, the latter half of the 1800s. The site's a Ramsar site in recognition of the, the water birds. Things like the migratory water birds, this one I took in, in uh, Fado and Barma Lake, uh, about, uh, it was during the, the drought 2007, 2008. Sharp tailed sandpipers, which uh, come in from Siberia. So they're actually feeding in these locations. But it's really the significance of the site on Ramsar for the type of wetlands, the area, and also for having a proportion of uh, Australian white ibis and straw neck divers um, regularly sustains about 1% of the population. And here we can also see uh, the uh, uh, royal spoonbills living in Cape. But of course, we're going to have a lot of critical uh, endangered species as well. Uh, here we've got a little egret nuptial plumes on the nest, and these are the things that water management tried to get through. Uh, in recognition of the significance, the, the site has been uh, upgraded from State Park and State Forest uh, to National Park in both Barma and in Millewa Forest. Uh, people still go to the river to camp. Um, <laughs> some are more uh, enthusiastic than others. But it's really the, the, the river that's driving a lot of the uh, ecology of the forest. And you can see just how flat the land or the, um, the channel capacity uh, is uh, during a summer irrigation level. So it doesn't take a lot to, to flood into the forest. Uh, just briefly, the, the, it's, a lot of talks are going to be concentrating on the effect of change in river regulation. Uh, these, this is the calendar year. The brown line is representing the channel capacity through Barma. The blue line is representing how high the river ought to get to have substantial depth on the floodplain for a lot of wet, wetlands. And you can see here that, you know, on average, four months of the year, in spring, the place will be flooded. Under current conditions with river regulation, a lot of the water is being held back in, in the spring uh, for release in the summer and autumn. The significance is twofold. One is we still have a predominantly winter spring dominated flood time, although the return frequency is a lot less. But we have in uh, summer, um, the river held at bank capacity. If it rains, it floods into the forest and wets up the wetlands. Another way of looking at this is uh, with one of these uh, rendergrams. All I want to show on this, it's, it's basically looking at uh, July through to June, so the, the financial year. Um, and the, the blue, or the, the, the darkness of the blue is indicating uh, a deep flood, so effectively that blue line on the previous chart, an effective flood. And straight away you can see the effect of, of river regulation. Natural is on the left, current is on the right. So the winter spring floodings have been substantially reduced. 
of significance is the inter-flood period, the, the drought sequences. You can see under the current conditions that we could have upwards of 10 years where the, the, the site doesn't get an effective flood, whereas under the natural, uh, a couple of years at most. So it's, it's a big difference for a lot of that part of the floodplain. The other significance here is these grey parts um, under the, the current arrangements of river regulation where we have a lot of small shallow flooding. So rather than the, the, the depth and the return frequency, we're getting a lot of shallow summer flooding. And again, a lot of talks will talk about the problems. Very briefly, what the, that looks like in cross-section on the floodplain is we have a lower winter-spring flood and the summer-autumn floods can often influence the floodplain. So you can see the area that is being influenced on the floodplain is getting um, shorter with corresponding effects on vegetation communities where they're actually shifting their zonations. And that's often at the expense of the more grass plains. The, the drought, the climate change predictions and what we've just experienced in millennium drought, we've had uh, big impacts there. And I think a lot of talks are again going to be speaking about the effect on um, fauna of that change and also the, the vegetation types. We've got nice little structures of, of primary, secondary and tertiary regulators. The big ones were constructed in the 1900s, to keep, uh, in 1950, to keep the, um, uh, the effects of river regulation out of the forest. And we have this um, environmental water allocation. Again, don't worry about the detail, but essentially Barma Miller has a 100 gigalitre annual allocation and also now a 50 gigalitre uh, lower security allocation that we can accumulate up to 700 gigalitres and we can release for Palmer Miller. In addition to now having the Living Murray water and the Commonwealth environmental water and also Victorian environmental water. Um, again, we won't delve into these too much detail from the time, but essentially we can manipulate flows with the environmental water to things like the, the red area here is how the river would have behaved had we not released environmental water. The blue line represents where the river actually got because we, we elevated and we can do amazing things. So if we know the research and how to target environmental water, we can apply it. And the green line is, is more for interest. In this particular year, that's how the natural situation would have behaved. So it's modeled data and you would have seen that would have been yet another year would have got the system through. So really, although we use probably one of the largest releases of water in Australia's history, probably 95, 98% of that actually got back to the river. Uh, so straight through. Another thing, that again, a lot of talks we'll, we'll look at will be the, um, this, the, the millennium drought, I guess people are, are terming it. Um, but certainly the dry period of the last five years of 1995, 96, where basically the, the, the tide went out and didn't come back in for five years. Um, and we had all sorts of uh, impacts in the forest, which again, different talks will go into, but essentially we had permanent waterways dry up and um, just finding the last of the refuge pools before they dried up to get environmental water to, because this stuff is unprecedented. And these are the type of things we're saving that actually come out of that little water hole. Um, we've got big landscape changes um, with giant brush. Again, a lot of talks will look at that. And also the black water event, which is really an artifact of the flood return frequency flashing the floodplain being too long. So black water can be good because it's a feeding, a, a fuel it's a source for the river, but not when we, we get too much, it's, it's supercharged. As a natural resource manager, an environmental water manager, we need to know how species tick. You know, it, basically you're pulling apart a, a car so that you can re reassemble it. We need to know the parts, and that's where the research and monitoring comes into it, is to populate tables like this. Um, a recipe book, if you like, for the different species. Living Murray programs funded 
uh, quite heavily the, the research, the many research that's in here, but not all, there's still a lot of other research. So there's A, B and O. A is generic across all the ICON sites along the Murray. Uh, Sean will talk about some of those. Uh, B monitoring is ICON site specific. And again, a lot of talks like understory or fish monitoring that's being undertaken in, in a lot of the ICON sites, but the methods are different. And the O monitoring is, <laughs> uh, the O monitoring is other monitoring, so things like CSIRO or universities that aren't getting funded from TLM, but the research is, is in integrated within the overall strategy. And of course, the basin plan with the, uh, the water that's been promised um, uh, is, is really an encouraging um, future for water management in these systems. So hopefully the, the type of, of activities we need on the ground, we've actually got an enabling water bucket. So we can actually do some serious um, targeted flooding uh, instead of just you know, watering uh, individual sites. And of course, climate change is gonna bring all sorts of surprises for us. And, and a modeling, maybe not, but it's okay. But, um, certainly the, the, the uh, warming climate, the summer uh, potential uh, increase in, in small flood events and the, uh, the dry interflood periods, it's going to be quite taxing, which means that we've really got to, again, nurse these things through. So really, for the rest of the conference, uh, people are going to get stuck straight into their talks with a minimal background, I don't need it now, but really, the type of information that we're gleaning from the, the multiple monitoring and research projects that are being undertaken, not only in Barma Milwa and but also broader, we can bring that knowledge in. We're hoping to use it for um, re-improving the ecology of the forest.